Hello, my name is Faye and last year in 2023, I embarked on the reading goal of reading more internationally, more diversely to travel the world in books. And of all the books that I read in 2023, you can look at my best and worst. I also read 25 books from 25 authors from different nationalities. So today we are traveling across the world and I've lumped all of these 25 books into five different categories of how I got them. I think some of them will be really warm recommendations, some of which we can argue about whether or not they should count. And with some of them, I would quite like to double up and get your recommendations for these countries because I feel like the books weren't always the best representations of getting to know that country. But I had some true gems in here. So we will start off with the first category, which is the easy countries. Four books fit into this category. These countries I never really struggle with reading from. I have definitely read multiple books from these countries, but the four that I tracked last year to represent those countries were number one, Sundial by Catriona Ward, which is set in the US, mainly in the Mojave Desert, where our protagonist Rob, who's the mother of two, travels to her former childhood home in the desert with one of her daughters who she worries is um, developing some troubling tendencies. This book was fun to read. It was published in 2022 and is marketed as horror, which is probably my main gripe. I think this was more a sort of mystery thriller. That's how it read. I wanted more supernaturalness. I wanted more gore. I didn't just want, just want experiments on dogs, but I do think it was cool to read a book to represent the USA and a US author that wasn't set in one of the big capitals. This isn't like a New York book, um, but rather one, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, whether this was sort of set in, in, in California or what the state was, but the desert. I enjoyed the book, but I do not struggle to find books by US American authors. Second Island is also a country that I don't actually struggle with. I read Snowflake by Louise Nealon last year, and this is set both in Dublin and in a rural farmland where our protagonist comes from, lives there with her family, and she is accepted to Trinity College in London, uh, in Dublin, sorry. I liked this book because we do get commentary on the sort of class divide in Ireland and the sort of difference between city and country people. And I thought that was actually quite a good pick for an Irish novel. It's an easy read. It reads a little like a sort of coming of age story, but has some sort of hard hitting themes in there about mental illness and grief. And I'd recommend it. Third is I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel, which is a London-based author, so we're reading for England here. We follow a young woman who has an affair with another man and then gets somewhat obsessed with both him and the woman he is in a relationship with. There's a lot of commentary on social media, but also the sort of continuum of subtle and blatantly obvious racism in the UK which I thought was interesting. There are so many books by English and British authors that you could read. I'm a Fan is a short one and that was discussed critically uh, a lot <laughs> last year as it was on the, was it on the shortlist? I think of the Women's Prize for Fiction. It's the favorite of the year for many readers. So um, even though it wasn't a home run for me because it got quite repetitive, I'm glad I read this book. And fourth, representing Germany, my home country, is Daheim by Judith Hermann, which hasn't been translated into English, although it has been translated into many other languages. Here, Judith Hermann um, has our female narrator move to the north coast of Germany and sort of make a new life after her now adult daughter has moved out and is traveling the world and her marriage has, um, I don't want to say failed, but ended. Um, it's a very quiet novel, more vibes, less plot, but I thought it was really beautiful and my stereotypes towards German fiction quite often is 
that it is very sort of cerebral and not atmospheric and lush and beautiful and somber. So I'm actually really glad that I did read this one. Next are six books that are coincidental picks for this reading challenge. I didn't set out to fit them into this reading challenge. I wasn't on the lookout for new countries, but they just happen to represent a new country in my reading challenge. So on number five, we have She Would Be King by Weya Tu Moore, which is set in the soon to be Liberia. Um, the author was born in Mongrovia, I believe, and had to flee the country. And in this magical historical fiction novel, we follow Bessa, who is shunned from her village somewhere in Western Africa because she is thought to be a witch. And her personal story takes part in front of the backdrop of um, the Republic of Liberia being um, instated, formed. Um, the extra like magical elements and especially sort of supernatural abilities that some characters have in this novel really turned this into a like gender bending novel. I loved it. It was one of my favourite books of 2023 and it just happens to bring me to Liberia in Africa. Published in 2023, I read Really Good Actually by Monica Haisi, who is a Canadian author. The book is set in Toronto, which was fun because I have been to Toronto, and our young female protagonist has just been divorced from her long-term boyfriend, but very short-term husband. So she struggles to be seen as a young divorcee and deals with her heartbreak and being single for the first time somewhere in her late 20s, I believe. It's a very fun novel. I recognise myself quite a bit, even though I have never been married. Um, but this whole sort of, you know, young academic having a drastic cut and change in her life somewhere in her late 20s was a bit close to home. I only whilst reading it realised this was written by a Canadian author. I don't think this is a particularly good pick if you want to learn more about Canada, um, but I'll take it. The seventh book is The Winners by Frederick Backman, translated by Neil Smith. I believe this was published in 2022 and it is the third and final book in the Bear Town series. Frederick Backman is an incredibly popular Swedish author. I have read more books by him and I can't really tell you that much about this book because it is the finale of a series. Suffice to say it is about family feuds and political hate in a, un, well not unnamed, but fictitious small town somewhere in the north in Sweden all wrapped up in the symbolism and love that the um, the population have for their youth ice hockey team. That was all a bit complicated. You might have heard of this book before. I liked it. It's incredibly emotional. It's almost manipulative in how emotionally invested you do get as a reader. I like Frederick Backman novels, even though I do think they are a bit formulaic at times. Maybe it is a good representation of life in a Swedish um, rural community. Perhaps it is, if I wasn't mistaken, the first book on my list that is a translated novel, which I do want to be prioritizing more. So just for that, I think Frederick Backman counts for the check mark for Sweden. Published in 1942, The Road to the City by Natalia Ginsberg is an Italian, a very short novel. So another translated fiction novel about a young woman, girl, well, on the cusp, I guess. In this coming of age story, let's make it easy, we uh, hear of our protagonist who grows up as one of five in a poorer family somewhere in Italy. And the reason I bought this and why it is a coincidental pick is that I wasn't seeking out to read a book from an Italian author, but the main character's cousin, who she becomes sort of almost enamoured with, is called Nini, which is the pet name that me and my cousin always used for my grandmother. Uh, so yeah, that was 
quite honestly, the only reason why I picked it up in the bookstore, I'm really glad that I did because it is told in such a sort of crisp manner. I think this was really the year where I appreciated short novels. Like if you can do something in under 200 pages, then do it in under 200 pages. I thought this was a really interesting commentary again on sort of class divide and not necessarily upward mobility, but envy uh, for um, people with money. It, it, yeah, it was a really good short story and I'm very curious to read more by this author. My ninth book on the list is An Island by Karen Jennings, who is a South African author. This is again a short book published in 2020. I'm looking down. Yes, 2020. And in this, we follow our uh, um, an older man who lives completely by himself on an unnamed little island as the um, light keeper, lighthouse keeper. He's, he lives there completely secluded after having spent a long stint in prison and one day a man washes up on his shores. That's all the plot I'm going to give you because this book really doesn't go in the direction that you expect. I thought it was really clever. There are hints, sort of back flashes to a past of a lot of um, political unrest maybe in South Africa, but the country isn't actually mentioned or sort of named in the book. So Karen Jennings is a South African author. The political backdrop isn't irrelevant to the story, but I do doubt whether this was my best pick that I could have chosen for this country. Also published in 2020, I read You Exist Too Much with My Real Life Book Club by Zaina Arafat. Um, so this book pick we read because we wanted to read a book from Palestine and Zana Arafat is an American Palestinian author and this sort of divide between two countries and two cultures is very much at the forefront of this story in which we follow a young woman who travels back and forth between the US and the Middle East growing up with her Arabic family and now as an adult she basically worked through a lot of the of the trauma and neglect that she experienced as a young woman as she goes into therapy for her love addiction she flits from one relationship to the next and i actually thought this parallel between growing up in two cultures and being torn between different um, relationships was a little heavy-handed. This book won the Lambda Prize for bisexual fiction, I think it's called, and I actually have my issues. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure whether I feel really comfortable um, about drawing the parallel of a bisexual protagonist in the book being torn between, you know, different genders. Um, maybe I'm reading it into the, the book and, and then that's completely my fault. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought some of this was too heavy handed, especially when the book talks about the experience of going into psychotherapy, mental health. I just thought that was all a little uh, it, this wasn't handled very subtly, um, but the other people in my book club, I think, enjoyed this quite a lot more than me. So this is a tentative recommendation. We're into the next category of books, the recommended books. Books that I was recommended, that I wanted to read because of all of the buzz, maybe online. Seven books. Let's get started. Number 11 is The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafón, Spanish author. <laughs> the book is set in Barcelona. The whole atmosphere of the city is very important. It's set in the 40s mainly, I want to say. And I think this was an excellent pick for a Spanish novel. My friend Anna gifted this book to me, which I'm very grateful for. It was one of her favourite books two, three years ago. It is the story of Daniel, I believe, who is the son of a antique books dealer 
And one day he finds a book that will change his whole life. A whole mystery is wrapped up in this book. And he has unwittingly brought himself into the story of this book because he selected it. The book was published in 2001 by Lucia Graves. I have absolutely no criticism of the translation. I thought this was a really just really solid, wraps you up in its pages book. I think it comes in at just under 500 pages, like really good novel. Number 12 is Happening by Annie Ernaud, who is a French author. And I read the German translation actually, Das Ereignis by translator Sonja Finch, I think she's called. And in this, Annie Ernaud reflects on uh, an abortion that she had as a younger woman. So this is non-fiction and I thought this book was really good and we do get some insight into France at the time and the sort of sex politics and um, the criminalization of the female body. I do think The Years that I also read last year by Annie Ernaud is a better representation of reading a French book because it takes us through the decades of her life living as a French woman in France. But I liked The Happening more, so I'm still going to recommend that one to you. Number 13 is Ghost Music by An Yu, a Chinese author. And I believe, if I'm not completely blanking, this was written in English, which is interesting. The author lived in China for the first 18 years of her life, I believe, in Beijing, which is also the setting of ghost music. In this, we follow the life of, well, not the, that's a bit too grand. We follow a very short sliver in the life of a woman who wanted to become a professional pianist, a concert pianist, but has scratched those dreams to support her husband. And she teaches the piano to children. Um, and one day her mother-in-law comes to live with them, but in effect really with her because she has to take care of her. And then she's also pressured by her mother-in-law to get pregnant, which is a bit of a sore point because she very much wants to, but her, father, her husband has been avoiding that whole topic and plan. I thought this was a good pick. Um, for China, actually, we do get some of the vibes in this like mega city Beijing. Her mother-in-law comes from the like Yunnan region, I believe, many, many, many miles away. And that is actually described quite beautifully, the more sort of rural landscapes that she remembers. There are a lot of sort of magical elements in this book. And even though I wish I could tell you about a book translated from Chinese or Mandarin. This one, to the best of my knowledge, was written in English. And I think that does represent a difficulty I had with researching books that I was genuinely interested in reading from China, because that is the one caveat to this challenge. I do want to read books that have a really good shot at becoming favorites. I don't want to read something that I'm not interested in just because it's from a certain country. I Want to Die But I Want to Eat Tteokbokki by Basahi is a South Korean non-fiction sort of memoir where the author talks about her experience of getting psychotherapy. She basically puts transcripts of her therapy sessions into this book. I thought it was really bad, uh, but lots of people really liked this. This was like a hugely successful book. The translator's name is Anton Hua, and I was sort of trying to figure out who the translator of this book was because I my copy came from the library originally and there were two different versions kicking around the internet pretty sure I read this one but maybe this is also due to it being republished I thought this was really trivial blah blah and best to just be kept for your personal records I, don't come at me loads of people love this book but I do think I want to read another Korean, South Korean book, just to sort of redeem myself. There are a few that I'm interested in, so I'm actually, thankfully, not worried that I'll get some other book recommendations. Number 15 is 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world by Elif Shafak. And I believe this Turkish author, I counted this book for Turkey, but according to Google, she has the British, French and Turkish nationality. I believe this book was written in English. So I should probably read another Turkish novel 
originally written in Turkish and translated. I do think for the whole full experience of reading across the world, I think reading translated fiction should be a strong element of this. But in this book, we follow the life of Tequila Leila, who is lying in a dumpster dead. She's been working as a prostitute in Istanbul and we sort of flash through different memories of her life. She tells us of her well found family. I really like this book. It's almost split in two and the second part gets way more action packed where we're not taking her perspective lying in the dumpster anymore. I thought this was a really uh, immersive read though. I also think the setting of Istanbul is quite palpable. Um, again, I've been to Istanbul once, I think more than 10 years ago. Yeah, way more than 10 years ago, uh, which was a, a, like a, a wonderful time in the city. Um, really lively, really interesting. And um, I, yeah, I would recommend this book. I'm slightly more unsure whether to recommend Magba by Tora Hjöleistotir, which is an Icelandic author. And this very short book, novella perhaps was translated by Mick Matic and I just saw this making the round on booktube. I think Gem of Books was the one that recommended it the most passionately and I remembered her talking about it so I read this book. I'm glad I get to tick off Iceland from this list but in this book we follow a young woman who enters into a relationship with a man she falls madly in love with and then can't really pull the brakes when she ends up getting more and more abused in this very toxic relationship. Um, again, probably not the best representation of Iceland uh, because the setting isn't really that relevant. Toxic relationships happen everywhere. It's told from her point of view and I do think it does a really good job at making you understand how you can end up in this situation. It doesn't sort of victim blame but again I thought this book relied very much on just giving you this claustrophobic feeling and I actually would have liked more plot. A Passage North by Anouk Arupragazam I think was an excellent pick to represent Sri Lanka. I'm counting this as a recommended book because it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and in this we follow Krishan, a young Sri Lankan man who travels from Colombo, the capital, to the north of the country to attend a funeral. This book wanted to do too much. I don't think this was a flawless book. We have a um, a road trip story mixed up with a sort of love story mixed up with commentary on the political situation in Sri Lanka and the civil war in the sort of earlier 21st century in Sri Lanka. Like, it wanted to do too many things but I do think it is a very approachable story that will let you travel to Sri Lanka in a book. So for that, I am glad that I read it. It was published in 2021, I believe. And maybe I just wasn't the right reader for this one. Okay, the next five books I'm calling the researched books. These are books that I actually set out to find because I wanted to push towards reading more diversely from different countries. So the first book in this list is Women at Point Zero, written by Egyptian author, Nawal El Sadawi. Originally written in Arabic, but Nawal El Sadawi's then husband, Shirif Fatata, translated this into English. It's a very short book and it sort of chronicles the life of a woman imprisoned for murder. And we basically find out why she, from a very sort of sheltered rural life, ends up working as a prostitute in Cairo. I thought this was a really hard to read book, really impactful. And then only later looking into it more, <laughs> I thought it became even more impressive because Nawal El Sadawi both was imprisoned herself, more for political reasons. And she also interviewed imprisoned women. She did a lot of work for women in Egypt and just knowing that she had all of that experience and knowledge and then wrote this 
really short, punchy novel made it an even more important reading experience for me, and I do really recommend this one. Scattered All Over the Earth by Yoka Tawada, unfortunately, was a disappointing read from Japan for me. This one is translated by Margaret Mitsutani, and the author, Yoko Tawada, I believe has also written in German since then. I think she, she actually works as a scholar in Germany. I'm, not, hmm, I'm slightly confused now. Anyway, we follow Hiruko, who is a climate refugee from former Japan in this soft sci-fi uh, novel. We follow her on a little road trip from the sort of Scandinavian countries to Germany with a sort of ragtag team of friends she makes along the way. And I wanted to love this. She meets linguists. She has developed her own pan-Scandinavian language. All of this sounds so cool. And then the book really fell flat. I think it wasn't edited well. It wasn't proofread well. And the characterizations of the characters in the novel were also read like a first draft. Like I was really disappointed in this one because I thought the premise was one of the best. I think I'll read something else from Japan this year. Please leave your recommendations here. I know that Japanese fiction has really like boomed in publishing, especially sort of in Germany in the last few years. So I'm very hopeful that you will be able to recommend something that I will enjoy more. Coming in as my 20th book I read last year from a different country is Childhood or Kindheit by Torva Didlifsson. I did read the German translation of this Danish memoir. Torva Didlifsson talks about her childhood in the 20s in Copenhagen. And as I went to Denmark in September last year, I did a little reading vlog uh, to go along with it. I wanted to read something by a Danish author. This was so, so good. The book was published in 1967. My German translation was translated by Ursula Allenstein. And the translation was excellent. The atmosphere was, was, was really so, it read so true. And thankfully it is the first in a non-fiction trilogy of Torva Ditlifsen. So I do want to move on and read more about this this force that she 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 must have been wanting to be an author as a, a, a girl in a working class family in Denmark in the twenties. Like go you. This this was really good. In said reading vlog, I also read A Girl Upon Heaven's Pier, Pier by Eva Lisa Mana, which is a Finnish author. I read this because last year I went to a book fair with my friend Anna, she's heavily, featuring heavily in this video, and I love the German independent publisher Gugolds. It's a beautiful book that I, I read, and the book mm, I thought was okay. It was published in 1951, my German translation was translated by Maximilian Mehrmann, and we follow a young girl who comes from a very unhappy family life as she wanders the streets in her small town that was then Finland, today is Russia. I, I thought this was a bit of a confused storyline, to be honest. I wasn't quite sure where it was going. There was some sort of philosophical discussions and dialogue like thrown in there in the middle, which lost me a little. But I am actually still glad that I did read this, even though I think there is much more Finnish literature that I can discover in the future. I will not say too much about Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady by Clarice Lispector, a Brazilian author, because in these short stories, um, the lives of unhappy women are told and nothing stuck with me. I talked about it in my worst videos of 2023. So I think I owe Brazil a redo. Please give me your recommendations. Please don't make it like Clarice Lispector. I want to go in with a better chance of me loving the book. And the final three books represent the Do They Count books. And this is your free card to judge me and my decisions. So the first one is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. I've counted this for Australia because according to the bio, Shelley Parker Chan is a not... Asian Australian author and there is no information on where they were born or which country uh, feels more akin to being their 
felt home country. I mean, all of this is also giving you a little taste in how difficult I do find like drawing boundaries. And I think the main reason why this book maybe shouldn't count is because it's set in the 14th century China and is a sort of fantastical, historical retelling of the forming of the Ming Dynasty as a young unnamed girl takes on the fate and future and name of her deceased brother Su Chong Bak, I think. It's an epic <laughs> story. It's the first in, I think, a duology, and I have not read on because I never complete series. I thought this was a really, really good book, and it also really opened my eyes to how little I know about Chinese history, because then, after completing the book, I went on to Google a little bit and discovered that all the names in this book actually relate to historical figures, and I didn't recognize that. Um, so the fact that I'm counting it for Australia may be a bit weird because it, it's set in China. All of it is set in China. Uh, so I probably also should just read another book from an Australian author. Like that has something more to say about Australia. The next one, I feel comfortable <laughs> with counting for Belgium, but I did argue with my friend Anna that we're obsessed with each other. Well, I'm obsessed with her. We argued whether or not this should be counted. So, I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Abman is a book by a Belgian author. It was written in French. I read the English translation and in this, a group of women is imprisoned in a cell. They don't know where they are. They don't know who is holding them captive. But one day, the men guarding them disappear. Their gate is left open and they embark on a journey of survival and discovery. Our protagonist is the youngest woman who was only a girl when they were captured and she does not remember a time before um, held, being held in captivity. It was so, it was such a quiet dystopian novel, which I think is a combination that is incredibly hard to get right. But because we don't know where this is set. Um, Anna argued we shouldn't count, she wouldn't count it for Belgium. I am counting it because I think um, this, this book was published in the 90s and I do think it makes sense within the, the 90s and Western Europe um, and just sort of the fears that we had as a whole and also sort of feminist discussions that were going on. I wholeheartedly recommend this book. However, even if you just, you know, want to read a dystopian novel and don't care who the author is, this one was really, really strong. And the final book I want to talk about that I loved was Swimming in the Dark by Thomas Yudrovsky, which I counted for Poland. And again, we can argue because Thomas Yudrovsky was born in Germany. He lives in France. His parents were Polish. But the whole book is also set in Poland. It's the love story between two men who are on drastically different ends of the political spectrum in the 80s in Poland. And their love is doomed given where they live and um, what their political beliefs and ideals are. I found this so moving, excellently written. It was written in English and it is actually interesting that it was written in English. The, the author did say in an interview that this felt like a language that hadn't been claimed by other family members or experiences. It was really just his tool to write a story. I thought that was really cool. But again, maybe I should read a book translated from Polish to actually count as a book from Poland. So I traveled to 25 countries last year in books. This year, I want to travel to 12 new ones. I hope that's realistic. I really would like you to drop your favorite translated fiction book in the comments because I do think that I got the easy books out of the way and I want to turn more towards translated fiction this year. But again, I'm only reading what really interests me. Life is too short. Let me know if you've read any of the mentioned books, if you're planning on maybe picking one up now that I've talked about it. That would be amazing. I'll see you next week. 
and I hope you're gonna have a happy reading week. Bye!